Searles. I'm the executive director of Wide River. We're a health IT consulting company. And on the phone with us today is also Anupam Sahai. He's the co-founder and president of Ega Stalt. We're very excited to be speaking with everybody today, given the lights of a recent development um, with the breach of Anthem, uh, and obviously almost 80 million patient records. So we knew cybersecurity in 2015 was going to be a big topic. No, we didn't plan the hack right before this webinar, um, but it is a great topic to address during the course of this and, and really stresses that no matter how big you are or how small you are in healthcare, this is only going to get worse before it gets better. And it's very important to understand the underlying causes of the risk that each of us face within our own organizations, be you a business associate, a payer, a healthcare covered entity, um, or just even an interested observer in the industry. Um, you know, how to assess, manage, and secure your critical access is important to all of us. And obviously that goes across all industries. So we'll go to the next slide. And just to give a little background, because I know everybody on the phone is not familiar, perhaps, with Wide River. Um, definitely some of you are. But Wide River, we're a health IT consulting company. We're based in the Midwest, but we actually have clients nationwide. Um, we offer meaningful use assistance, regulatory quality improvement, basically clinical and practice transformation services be the EHR, rip and replace, um, optimization, informatics, mentoring, training, project management services. Um, you know, our mission is to support the healthcare foundations of our communities. We've served over 1,600 providers, close to 60 hospitals, 140 rural health clinics, um, you know, number of FQHC surgical hospitals, and everybody faces the same concerns. Doesn't matter how big you are, how small it is, um, you know, you still have the same regulations you have to meet and the same challenges. Obviously, that there are flavors of challenges and unique circumstances. Small rural health clinics obviously have perhaps a bigger issue um, finding financial, uh, you know, finances to be able to afford some solutions. But, you know, it really is about community. And I think all of us working together can help advance, uh, you know, better health care for our patients, for ourselves as well as a much more secure environment. And on a palm, if we'll go to the next slide, I think that's where industry experts can truly help all of us out. You know, there is no way each facility can have an expert in every single healthcare domain. Um, when, it, when we talk about IT, we talk about security, we talk about, um, you know, clinical improvement, we all are working um, as hard as we can wearing six different hats. And so having someone like Anupam and his team uh, come in from Ega Stalt, you know, this is something that they are very familiar with and, and can do very well. And Anupam, he's an accomplished management marketing technology leader. He's got extensive, you know, experience in the field of health IT as well as other domains, um, cloud computing, security and compliance networking, a uh, number of worldwide patents, published, you know, almost a dozen technical papers, We've had him speak uh, to our clients before. Great reception, very timely topic. Anupam, thank you so much again uh, for being willing to do this and address uh, you know, our audience today. Because again, with, as you know, the Anthem uh, breach and others, uh, this, you know, again, it's not going away anytime soon. So, so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Todd, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anupam Sahai, and uh, the topic that I will cover today is um, is very current. It's very uh, uh, very topical, and it it deals with security risk, cybersecurity risk, and how to assess, manage, and secure your critical assets. Uh, the the questions that I will try to answer during the course of the session today is to give you a bit of a background on uh, the biggest breaches that have happened in 2014, what were the lessons learned, and, and that will lead us to what we, what, we in, what we will be seeing in 2015, whether we like it or not. Some of these threats are increasing by the day, and the nature of these threats are morphing into something different. So we'll talk about that. Then we will also look into 
what are the critical drivers for security adoption in general, and, and then, then uh, given that background, we will jump into the main topic of uh, uh, critical assets definition, what does, uh, how do you go about assessing the risk factors, and uh, how do you continue to maintain your current risk status so that you are not uh, open, uh, open up to, opened up to attacks. So uh, we'll talk about some of the best practices, lessons learned, and, and then uh, near the end we'll talk about AG5, which is an automated tool to deal with all of your security risk and compliance management needs. So this is, um, this is uh, an automated tool that we built over the, over the last uh, few years based on our industry experience and feedback. And then at the end we'll have, uh, we will have Q&A. If you have questions during the session, please type in uh, your questions in the Q&A section of the GoToWebinar and we will pick it up near the end of the session. Uh, again, thank you again for, for um, taking the time and attending the webinar today. So let's get started. Before I get started, let me put some standard disclaimers around, around the content. What we present here is, uh, is uh, information that is subject to change and subject to multiple interpretations. So please don't consider this to be legal advice. It's meant for education purposes. So let's start with some background in terms of what are the biggest breaches that have happened in 2014. And for that, I will draw your attention to this particular infographic. This is updated in real time in, in, uh, on a daily basis. And it's actually pretty, um, pretty interesting. You can see here that it's uh, tracking all the biggest breaches that have happened uh, up, to, up to now. Uh, it's including the Anthem breach, which uh, involves 80 million records, as Todd said. Uh, before that, there was uh, Home Depot. And by the way, the size of the bubble is uh, reflective of how big the breach was in terms of number of records. So Anthem, Home Depot, uh, Morgan Chase, eBay was 145 million, uh, Target um, was 70 million. So it's a big, these are big numbers. And um, some of the not so big numbers like Sony Pictures, which was involving only 30,000 records, but the bigger damning factor there was it, it involved about 100 terabytes of data that was stolen, and that had severe consequences along with the 30,000 records or so that was stolen. So the point that I want to take, want you to take away from this is that um, the breaches are increasing by the day. Uh, the uh, the scale of the breaches are are going up as well, and and this is primarily because the attackers are getting very organized. They have very sophisticated tools. And studies have shown that it literally takes weeks and months after the hackers have broken in to detect that a hack happened, that a breach happened, and, and by that time all the data is gone and, and so it's a lost cause, uh, and which of course leads to a number of ramifications. So I wanted to show that. Now the other graphic that I want to show you is, um, is similar to that where, um, where it, it where this is breaking down on a month-by-month -month basis, the different breaches that happened. Sorry. So this is also, you'll find the link in the presentation, but basically on a month-to-month -month basis uh, of 2014, for example, it lists down the biggest breaches that took place that month. And uh, what you find in a consistent fashion is that starting Jan 2014, um, which, which resulted in 350,000 records, then we had Orange, um, then we had KT Corp. So you're talking about millions of records being affected. eBay was 145 million. And so this has been a consistent theme, whether we like it or not, that uh, breaches have become very frequent, they're becoming very big, and, um, and they're affecting businesses of all size. Whether you're a small business or a large business, it doesn't matter. And, and this is reflective of the different um, studies that, were, that have been done so for example, roughly there are about 15 to 30 incidents per month that are happening, and, and this number has grown by 100% year over year. And so you're talking about 30 to 60 million identities being stolen every month, and that's a big, big number. And these are, mind you, detected 
breaches and the number of breaches that will take some time before they, they show up on the radar. So it's a big problem and, and all by all expert uh, evidence that these threats will continue to, to, uh, to power ahead. And um, some of the key things that we expect uh, in 2015 to continue is uh, that these, uh, that businesses will continue to be under attack and not so much consumers but businesses and uh, the, especially the healthcare business which was accounting for about 40% of all the breaches that took place in 2014 were affecting healthcare businesses. So healthcare business will continue to be under attack and, and the nature of attacks will, will now morph from uh, credit card or, or personal information to, to more organized um, corporate and nation-based espionage. And this is basically based on the recent uh, Sony Picture incident where, where um, uh, Sony Pictures was held to ransom literally to, uh, to take care of certain um, movie release dates, etc., etc. So the nature of, uh, nature of attacks are changing and um, you know, we, we saw a lot of attacks based on the open source, open source software, which was, um, so we heard terms like shell shock, heart bleed, and recently ghost vulnerabilities that were discovered which compromised certain open source software. Uh, those attacks will continue but uh, a lot of it will shift to mobile and, and non-Windows platforms. Uh, Internet of Things is something that you're hearing about where every device or every, every gadget becomes connected on the Internet so that becomes prone to, prone to attacks as well. And as enterprises uh, move towards bring your own device kind of an approach, uh, it kind of complicates matters further. So there's a need to keep track of that and, um, and ensure that those um, cyber attacks are detected and um, remediated very quickly. Regulatory landscape, so number of regulations, whether it's HIPAA, PCI, SOX, uh, the number of regulations that require you to ensure privacy and security of data. And, and so the liability clause there is uh, getting heavier and, and so there's a need to, to ensure that the data is not compromised. Uh, payment systems have been a big source of uh, attack point and, um, and, and mobile payment systems add further complications to that. And all of this is uh, happening because a number of uh, the ability to detect these attacks and, and be able to be proactive about preventing such attacks the skill gaps is, is, is huge and the organizers are, um, the, sorry, the attackers are much more organized, they're much more sophisticated and a common IT person sitting in a small business or a large enterprise is, may not have the skills or the tools required to match the aggression of cyber attackers. So, so that's the, really the challenge that we are faced with where there's an asymmetry in terms of sophistication and tools that attackers have and the small and medium and large businesses do not have the tools and the knowledge required to, to prevent such attacks. So unfortunately cyber security attacks will continue, cyber attacks will continue to grab the headlines and I'll talk about how, how the nature of these attacks morph. So which businesses are getting impacted? This is pretty much across the board but certain, certain uh, verticals are getting more affected than the others. Uh, namely financial, healthcare, manufacturing and retail are the dominant verticals under attack. But if you look at the attack patterns, it's uh, straddling pretty much uh, horizontally with some focus on these uh, verticals that I talked about. Now the motivation for the security breaches, this is an interesting, uh, interesting chart that, uh, that shows that earlier the incentive was to really be able to um, was financial incentive where you were where cyber attackers or hackers were stealing credit card information or stealing personal information and there's an underground market for for selling for reselling credit cards and personal information uh, apparently you can get a dollar or two per credit card uh, and um, uh, about single digit dollars nine ten dollars per personal information and there's a window of opportunity where wherein you can, um, you can leverage this credit card information and buy and, and, uh, and buy, uh, buy using the credit card information. So the financial incentive 
which was the driver um, till recently has uh, ha it continues to be a driver but another another key ray rise in the motivation level is espionage as I was saying and in 2014 and 2015 the trend continues this is uh, from 2009 to 2013 so espionage is a leading leading driver for for um, for security breaches uh, the objective there is to steal intellectual property or steal uh, mission critical data from businesses uh, financial based uh, motives will continue and and that um, that trend continues Who's responsible for these attacks? If you, if you look at the trend there, again, external hackers continue be, to be the dominant uh, factor in terms of uh, responsibility for, for making these breaches happen. Uh, there, there is some contribution from internal employees or malicious insiders, uh, but most of, the con most of the percentage of breaches um, from a threat actor perspective is happening because of external players, external um, organized crime, cyber crime uh, criminals. So one thing that I want to take, uh, want you to take away is clearly, besides all the media hype, is that security breaches are are a reality. We cannot ignore it. Whether you are a, a small business or a large business, uh, the the incentive for hackers to break in and steal the information might might change based on the vertical. But this is a common problem, and as I said, it takes weeks and months before you can detect that a breach has happened, and it might be too late before before you detect it and, and thinks the damage would have been done. So there is a need to understand the nature of these cyber attacks uh, and how one can, as a business, go about preventing and detecting uh, these attacks from happening. And there's some basic fundamental things that can be done, and the good news is that um, a lot of these breaches, 97 of the breaches were avoidable using very simple or intermediate controls. So that's the good news and um, as the nature and the actors of these breaches, uh, breaches uh, change, uh, you will see that certain basic, uh, basic um, things that you can do will, will prevent most of these attacks from happening. And, and uh, the statistics out there which say that uh, it took months to discover these attacks or breaches from happening after they happened, et cetera, et cetera. So why is security risk analysis important? Let's, um, given the background of the frequency and the, and the rampant, rampant behavior of the cyber attackers, why do we need, why do we need to worry about uh, security risk analysis? What does this term mean? So what, what security risk analysis is doing is is trying to be proactive to, uh, in, in terms of assessing the current state of affairs from a business perspective. And uh, it tells you what's your current risk exposure and how, how easy will it be for attackers to break in and steal the information that you're trying to protect. So your critical assets can be stolen if you don't, uh, don't stay on top of the security risk analysis um, uh, uh, program, as it were. It's been found that average cost of a security breach is about $5.5 .5 million. It varies by the business size. Now this includes cost uh, per record, but also brand damage cost, which can, which can exceed this number. And, and if you have a breach in a large hospital or a large business like um, Target or Sony, uh, the brand damage is huge where customers stop trusting you with their personal information. And so security risk analysis allows you, enables you to identify all the gaps that exist in the organization and allows you to proactively go after fixing the problems that are detected through this process of security risk analysis. And, and of course, this is also required by a number of compliance regulations like HIPAA, PCI, and FISMA. But um, with or without regulation requirements, it's absolutely important to do security risk analysis to understand the current state of the union from a risk exposure perspective. So let's dive into it a little bit more. What does risk management mean? How, how does one, as a business IT person or, or a security officer, deal with this, uh, this issue of analyzing the risk exposure and uh, what, what can they do? What can we do? 
So let's get some definitions out of the way first. What is risk? As the term literally means that you're essentially trying to ascertain or um, estimate the extent to which your the business is exposed to external attackers. And it could be external attackers or it could be internal malicious insiders. So any attacker, external or internal, um, what are the chances that they can steal the data and compromise uh, valuable assets that are important to the company? And um, this is about stealing information, uh, information data. This is about uh, stealing data that's critical. Uh, it can also lead to um, compromise of the data could also lead to operational failures. For example, um, if they bring down uh, um, like the Amazon, Amazon was brought down to the knees because of a hack attack, and, and so it could affect the operational continuity. That's some of the form of uh, of risk exposure. So it deals with any and every kind of um, of risk that the business would have due to compromise of critical information or critical operations. And so the risk assessment is the process of identifying estimating and, and prioritizing the security risk so that you can focus on the ones that are most important and, um, and then go after them to fix the problems that are found. So what are critical assets that, uh, that businesses need to be worried about? And, and this, the answer may not, be a, there not, may not be a single right answer. It varies by the industry. It varies by the, uh, by the regulation. And, uh, Essentially, critical assets are anything that's important to the to the company, whether it's people-related uh, assets, process-related assets, or critical data. And um, it can it can be intellectual property, it can be confidential data like uh, personal health information for the healthcare vertical. It could be personal personal information for for PCI or any other vertical information, uh, vertical um, verticals um, such as uh, retail and e-commerce. So all of these are critical assets. Operational continuity, as I said, could be another critical asset. You want to make sure that your business is up and running, available for customers to, to buy, buy uh, goods that they want from you. So all of these are critical assets. And of course, the brand. Brand is a critical asset. You want to make sure that um, you are not compromised. The data that you, that you have from your customers is not compromised. If it does, then your brand is affected as well. And, and the, the, the corollary to the critical asset question is, what's the value of the critical asset? The value could be a cost or, or an overall dollar value, but there is a, uh, there's a bigger, bigger um, question there, which is around, let's say, the brand. How do you estimate the brand value? And, and uh, so that's part of the risk assessment process where you want to make sure that all your critical assets are, are uh, valued and then you put together processes and, and uh, controls to protect those critical assets from being compromised. And then the other related question is, how likely is it that these assets can be compromised? And if they do, what's the impact uh, uh, due to that uh, compromise? So all these are questions that, um, that are required as part of the risk assessment process, where you're trying to identify the critical assets, you're trying to un understand the value that these critical assets contribute to the company, and then how likely how likely is it that these assets can be compromised by these threats or attackers, and um, and if so, what is the impact? So these are all elements that contribute towards uh, risk analysis, and and I want to give you a glimpse of what HIPAA requires. This is uh, legalese coming from HHS, the uh, the Department of Health and Human Services which uh, enacted HIPAA, uh, which enforces HIPAA. And, and so this is text coming from HIPAA, which basically tells you that um, you need to protect patient health information, and there's a need to do risk assessment to ensure that you're protecting it and assessing the, the risk exposure that, um, that as an organization you have. So from a risk management perspective, um, I want to just briefly touch upon what are the different aspects that, as a business, you need to do uh, to ensure that you understand what does uh, what does the risk exposure uh, imply for your for your business. So the first thing is that 
you're trying to identify the critical assets that you have that I talked about and their properties and characteristics. Then you're trying to assess the and discover threats that might be affecting your business or affecting these critical assets. And once you know that, then the next step is to come up with a risk score and, and of course mitigate the risk so that these critical assets are protected through a combination of people, processes, and, and controls that, uh, that you put in place to ensure that your risk exposure is minimized. And this needs to be done in an ongoing fashion, in a, in a continuous manner, so that, uh, so that it's, it continues to be strengthened on a day-by-day -day basis. So that leads us to the definition of risk management. Uh, as I said earlier, it includes identifying the critical assets, identifying the threats and vulnerabilities that might be used to exploit uh, the assets and to compromise the assets. Uh, there, there might be a need to put together some processes and controls to, to implement and address these vulnerabilities and, and, and uh, no risk calculation is complete without a likelihood and impact uh, combination. It tells you whether this particular um, asset is critical, whether this particular scenario of a threat compromising a vulnerability is, uh, is important to you, is, uh, is a high priority for you. And, and then continuously monitoring all of these is is critical part of risk management. I won't go into this uh, framework, but uh, suffice it to say that all of what I talked about from a risk management perspective, where you're looking into threat sources, threat uh, threat events that exploit vulnerabilities, and um, your vulnerabilities could be on critical assets, and and based on the likelihood and impact of these combination of threats and vulnerabilities you can estimate the overall risk exposure. And the critical part of all of this is that the organization has to put together a set of security controls which prevents these threats and, and vulnerabilities from being exploited. And, and, and so this is all comprising the risk uh, management uh, model that any business needs to, needs to uh, implement. And by the way, this is a model uh, proposed by NIST, which is a national standards body that uh, that defines and drives this uh, whole uh, risk management process. So the question is, uh, why are the current security programs falling short? Why is it, is it that there's so much of cyber hacking going on? And um, why can't businesses uh, uh, do the required things to, to get their act together? So there are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, there is too much of confusion around what does it take to, to ensure and minimize the cyber, cyber attacks. Uh, do you need to put together some security software? What kind of security software? Um, do I need to do risk assessment or do I need to do compliance assessment? Will any of these lead to, to, the, right, uh, to the right answer? Uh, also the question is which control frameworks should I use? Um, if I'm compliant with HIPAA, does it mean I'm secure? If I'm compliant with PCI, does it mean secure? And the answer is that it's a combination of things that you need to do. And hopefully, during the session today, you'll, you'll get some of these answers um, for, for these questions. And the other complication is that there are a number of solutions that look at security in a piecemeal manner. So there are a number of solutions that look at compliance only. There's another set of solutions that look at vulnerabilities and, and, and risk separately. And so there's a lot of confusion in terms of deployment, in terms of management, and that makes it hard to deploy and, and, and the solution is incomplete. So you need to know which, picks, which components to pick, uh, to mix and match to get a complete program. And, and, and automation is another problem that um, these, these tools existing today are siloed and they don't allow you to look at things in a unified manner. And of course the skill level required to deal with the existing tools requires a lot of domain expertise and uh, the burden of updating and maintaining these tools is left to the end user or the IT manager. So, um, and of course, number of uh, small businesses, medium businesses may not have the expertise in-house to deal with all of these. So these are some of the challenges that, uh, that uh, we hear from the field, from our customers, and that has led us to, to develop the solution that, uh, that we have done. Now, before we jump into the solution, the automated solution that solves the problem, let me spend a few minutes talking about 
what's the right framework for assessing cybersecurity risk? And uh, while there are a number of regulations like HIPAA, PCI, that deal with protecting certain critical assets. So for example, HIPAA deals with protecting uh, PHI information. And, and that's the focus of the regulation, HIPAA. Uh, so there are a number of, uh, there's a security program that HIPAA recommends, which is uh, focused around protecting PHI. And that's really the purpose of HIPAA. So if you are dealing with critical assets that go beyond PHI information, then there is a need to have a broader uh, security program. Similarly, if you do PCI, which is for credit card industry, uh, the focus of PCI as a, as a regulation is to put together a security program around protecting uh, personal information, credit card information. So it does its job very well, but if you're looking at a cybersecurity hardening kind of an approach for your entire business, there is a need for a more bigger uh, security framework which is really the answer there is SANS 20. And these are uh, critical 20 controls that as a business you need to implement to protect your critical assets, to protect against cyber attackers. And this has been evolved, the, this framework has been evolved uh, through an international effort which, uh, which has taken multiple years. So it's driven by a cyber security council It's driven by um, a council of cybersecurity. It's an international effort, and um, it defines 20 critical controls that that businesses need to implement. And this is an evolving set. As we know that vulnerabilities are evolving by the day, they're changing by the day, and uh, and the group does a great job of uh, updating the controls based on threats and how they evolve, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's a very active community, and it, it, it's actually a very commendable effort by by, a, by international body. So the the Science 20 controls really deals about deals into multiple phases of um, threat detection and prevention. And the four categories that it really focuses on is first is resource hardening. You want to make sure that any vulnerabilities or any resource related uh, issues that might be there. Is, is addressed first, and then access related, uh, and then detection of attacks, and then response and recovery. So the cyber defense life cycle is managed by the Science 20, Science 20 framework. And uh, I just want to give you a sense of what it includes. Uh, it includes all those four stages of cyber defense. There are 20 controls, as I said, and um, it takes care of all, um, all software, all hardware, vulnerability assessment, wireless devices, applications that are running, and um, I won't go into the level of detail here, but suffice it to say it's a very complete framework that continuously evolves to meet the needs of the international community. So from a best practice perspective, if you're a business uh, owner or if you are the chief security officer, the it's important that you look at SANS 20 and not only that, you use SANS 20 to do your risk assessment and, and the steps that are required here are to first do a, a baseline which allows you to understand the gaps that exist today and, and then put together a, an implementation roadmap that allows you to, to um, implement the controls that are missing today. And um, SANS 20 has uh, a two-phase approach to implementing the controls. Some of them are very simple to do that you can, you can implement right away. Some of it might take some time, might need some tools. And, um, and then you have to continuously manage this process in a continuous fashion. Uh, do the assessment and, and review the process every, every few months. So all of this is part of the SANS 20 framework and best practices that, that we recommend when you're implementing SANS 20. And, and by the way, all the cyber attacks that have happened over the last 10 years or so can be categorized into nine different patterns that you see here. Uh, the patterns are pause, point of sale intrusion, web attacks, insider misuse, physical theft loss, uh, uh, crimeware like malware, card skimmers, cyber espionage, and denial of service attacks, and 
and miscellaneous errors is, uh, is a catch-all category. But all attacks that have happened over the last 10 years from a cyber, cyber uh, crime perspective can be categorized into these nine different categories. And um, these are the 20 different controls which, which are applicable to deal with these nine attack patterns. So what you're seeing here is really um, the, the picture here tells you that SANS 20 controls deals with all the known attack types, attack patterns that uh, in a very effective manner. And um, it captures the vertical level uh, complexity and the attack type level complexity in its uh, framework and it is continuously evolving as time goes by. So having the control framework, doing the risk assessment is important, but things change and, and there's a need to do continuous monitoring. And this is basically coming from the need that uh, threat attacks are, are changing by the day, they're morphing by the day, there are new vulnerabilities that are found on a daily basis, and there might be organizational changes, so there is a need to repeat some of these uh, activities on a regular basis. And the frequency of, uh, of, of um, repeating this uh, varies by the activity type. Uh, so for, for example, the assessment can be done every six months or annually. The scans um, and other uh, log management can, can happen more frequently where you're looking at operational information to ensure that you're not compromised from a cyber attacker perspective. So there's a, there's a set of um, daily housekeeping stuff uh, leading up to, uh, with, with different frequencies, which can, which can be done daily, weekly, quarterly, or annually, that is required if you want to be a, an organization that's on top of any, any cyber security attacks. So, with that, let me, let me change gears and, and talk about AGFI, which is an automated tool that deals with all of your uh, security, cybersecurity, risk assessment, and risk management and monitoring uh, requirements. And as I said earlier, we, designed, we have designed the tool from the ground up to address some of the problems that I mentioned earlier. Um, we, we have one single automated tool that does it all. It does security monitoring, it does compliance management and risk management together. It's offered through a cloud-based subscription model and um, it can take care of all assets whether they're sitting inside the company or outside the company. Um, uh, SAN20 is the control framework that we support as part of the tool and the tool has complete, um, a complete knowledge base and an expert system built into it that provides a wizard-like guidance to you uh, so that even if you don't have the domain expertise, you will have complete guidance and visibility into assessing your current status, how risk exposed are you, and then it will guide you through a, a wizard-based approach to fix the problems that are found. So the intention here is to provide complete soup to nuts guidance without assuming domain expertise. That, uh, that today is, is, is a big challenge. Uh, from a SANS 20 perspective, uh, the, the complete SANS 20 framework that's available, uh, it's integrated with the security scanning tools, which otherwise are siloed today. So we, we have an integrated scanner with the SANS 20 control framework and integrated risk management that uh, unifies and creates a single gap report with all, all issues that are identified across these different uh, applications that are traditionally siloed. This is the, the workflow automation that is supported in the tool. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but give you a glimpse of what you can expect. So the tool will allow you to automate the entire process of uh, assessing your security and risk. And it does that by, by doing a baseline, which, uh, which is an initial assessment. It tells you the gap reports, gaps that exist today, so, you, so that you know whether you're exposed to cyber attackers or not. And, uh, and then it will guide you through a, a wizard-based approach for, from a remediation perspective. So if you're missing, uh, if you do not have a security strategy, if you do not have policy documents or contracts, it will, it will, it will help you there. It will provide uh, that information. We've got a complete suite of uh, policy documents built into the tool. Uh, there are best practices available in the tool that tells you what other industry um, industry players do and, and what's effective and what's not. 
So all and everything that you need to, to fix the problems that are found, to remediate the problems that are found, is in the tool. And that's really the, the power of the automation that we bring into the, into the solution. And once you've done the remediation, then you can go back and reevaluate it and then repeat the process in an ongoing fashion. So, so the tool allows you to not only automate just one repetition of this cycle, but you can repeat, uh, you can schedule repetitions of this cycle uh, as, as needed. So as I said earlier, some of the tasks might need to be done daily, some of it be, would be weekly, monthly or annually. And you can, you can use the tool to schedule these tasks uh, and repeat them on a frequent basis as needed. Uh, and at any point in time, you will have access to a, a dashboard, a number of reports that, that allows you to know where you stand today. So it's all uh, built into the tool, it's automated, and um, you have real-time information about, your, about the, your current risk status and, and security status. I won't go into this detailed uh, flowchart, but suffice it to say that the complete process of risk assessment has been automated in the tool and it minimizes information uh, input from you and the tool will uh, discover the assets that are found on the on the network automatically it will um, categorize them and uh, based on that it will estimate the threats and vulnerabilities that are going to be affecting the assets critical assets that you care about and it will come up with a risk score determination automatically with minimal with minimal input from you and and then you can re, re uh, schedule or you can schedule repetitions of this particular operation in a regular fashion at any point in time you'll have access to a risk dashboard which tells you what are the critical assets that are that are exposed and uh, and what's their value you have multiple uh, uh, viewpoints in the dashboard so for example here uh, it tells you what are the current uh, security risk and, and, and compliance risk um, if, if applicable. So you have complete uh, real-time visibility into, into this particular, um, your current status. And by the way, if you want to, uh, if you want to try out the tool, you can go to egistalk.com slash community to download and play around with this uh, automated tool. Uh, it comes built in with policy documents, uh, templates, um, BA agreement for HIPAA, uh, if you are dealing with SANS 20, it has all the policy documents for all the 20 controls that you need to not only um, understand what needs to be done, but there are procedural guidelines in the, in the tools itself uh, that allows you to implement SANS 20 in its full glory. Uh, there's a built-in research, uh, research and, and knowledge base that's available in the tool that allows you to guide through the, through the questions that you might have. Um, you can do sensitivity analysis to understand where should you focus your efforts on. Once you know the risk score, you can you can do what if analysis to figure out the top um, top priority issues that you need to address. So you've got all all the tools that you need, all the the knobs that you need that uh, that allows you to understand your current risk status and and then monitor and manage it in an ongoing fashion. So I know I covered a lot of information here, but um, you, can, uh, you can reach out to me if you need any further information. In closing, what I would say is that you can use eGestalt AGFI and, and the SANS20 framework that's provided by AGFI to deal with all of your cybersecurity needs. So cybersecurity, addressing cybersecurity needs uh, requires you to assess your risk first and then put together a control framework like SANS20 with its policies and procedures and tools that are required to, to address some of the cybersecurity threats that you're seeing. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the cybersecurity threats, 97% of them, can be dealt with by very simple intermediate controls. And, and with a framework like SANS20, the percentages go much higher in terms of preventing such attacks from happening. And, and there's a need to implement a security program with, with monitoring. And, and there's a need to do risk analysis in an ongoing fashion so that you're continuously on top of the latest threats and vulnerabilities that are evolving by the day. So typically there's a, a new vulnerability that shows up once every week or, or, or more frequently. So there's a need to keep up with the, with the new threats and new vulnerabilities that are coming up. And risk analysis is really a way to understand your risk exposure 
and then that's a step in the direction of uh, hardening your cybersecurity needs. So if, if you're interested in, in, uh, in playing around with the tool, as I said, please download a community edition, which you can find at egestall.com slash community, or uh, if you're interested in uh, having your, your service provider or your internal IT staff or security staff uh, in, uh, evaluating the tool, then do please let us know. With that, um, let, me, uh, let me pause here and um, see whether there are any uh, questions for what I talked about. Yeah, Anupam, we, we, uh, um, we had a couple questions come in. Uh, the most obvious was a great question that I think all of us ask. You know, HIPAA was released back in 2003. You know, why is this still an issue and do you think we finally hit the tipping point? So the question is whether HIPAA is still an issue and what's the tipping point? Uh, can you no, given, given that HIPAA was released a long time ago, why has it taken healthcare so long to get to this point? And then do you finally think we're at the tipping point where more people are, I think, taking care of what needs to be done or do we still have a lot of lessons to be learned? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. So HIPAA was enacted first in 1996 and and uh, it really didn't get much attention till 2009 when the high tech or the recovery act was enacted and that's where the there was some carrot and stick approach taken by the government where uh, there were fines for not implementing hipaa and and there were some additional um, controls that were added to hipaa uh, so high tech is really when the activities about uh, hipaa adoption started and then hipaa omnibus which which uh, was enacted in 2013, September, is what um, finally got everybody going because heavy penalties and fines were put in place for, uh, for businesses that didn't comply. And of course, there were incentives put in place. The government had, has put aside um, $28 billion for, for meaningful use attestation. So the carrot and stick approach that the government has been taking has uh, really resulted in uh, a lot of activity. But you're right, the, the still about, uh, I was reading somewhere, 47% of providers still haven't, uh, sorry about this, haven't um, implemented HIPAA, and that's, uh, that's a matter of time before it, uh, it gets addressed. So I think the tipping point is, uh, is there, and I think uh, we hear more and more that uh, HIPAA compliance is something that, uh, that is being addressed. The, there is also an education issue, especially in the small businesses where they kind of running, running every day, uh, looking at more tactical issues, and HIPAA is uh, is not at the top of the mind. But overall, I think um, uh, there's been a lot of hectic activity around HIPAA adoption in 2014, and it'll continue for. Yeah. yeah, and I would agree. I mean, we see a lot of very small clients to obviously the largest health systems, and you know, it is tough for the small clients to, to catch up. One could argue that perhaps they should have been focused on this from the get-go. But as we all know, for a long time, HIPAA was an afterthought and possibly even a joke to some. And now it definitely has teeth. And so the small independent provider groups and smaller hospitals and community centers are trying to catch up. And they want to, but obviously they're finding the cost of entry getting state-of-the-art protection uh, as a barrier. Um, but, you know, how... How does your uh, platform compare in terms of pricing and things like that? How is it structured? Yeah, so the pricing is, um, it's been priced very uh, uh, conveniently for adoption by small practices in the healthcare sector all the way to large businesses. So um, when we kind of went into the product design and when we launched the product, one of the key feedback was that we wanted to get the small and medium businesses to, to be able to adopt the solution. So it's very cost effective in that sense compared to anything that's out there and it makes it affordable for small, medium businesses to adopt it. If you are a large business, large enterprise which needs uh, multi-division, multi-location capabilities, we also have that which is priced differently. But uh, it's very affordable um, and we can talk about specific numbers if this, that's of interest uh, to anybody. Please sure, we got a couple more questions. We'll try to get them in here before the end. So let's let's kind of get to some of those. Um, one came in: How does SANS 20 relate to ISO? Um, you know, two seven zero zero one. Twenty seven K. Yep. 
Yeah. Yeah. So ISO 27. Um, so think of SANS 20 as being the latest control framework, which is focused on security-related issues, and and it leverages all the best practices that exist from other regulation frameworks. So it drives its um, controls from ISO, from NIST uh, 800, um, and uh, other control regulation frameworks. So this is the latest and greatest framework that uh, has been created by the Cybersecurity Council. And this has the blessing of the federal government as well. And uh, as you might know, the federal government is, uh, is going to be enacting some kind of a cybersecurity law that pretty much mandates that every business uh, does some minimal stuff to, to ensure cybersecurity or to prevent cyber attackers from stealing the data. So this is the latest and greatest framework that leverages the other um, existing frameworks that might be out there. Interesting. Um, so one of the questions that came in, and it's probably a great question because this, this concept of who's responsible for a breach, business associates, vendors, things like that. The question is, if we purchase your service and there ends up being a breach, who's responsible? And I guess at the heart of that, it would mean that they use your product, they scan the network. You know, two scenarios. One, they uncovered a breach. Um, they thought they mitigated it, but perhaps not. And then the other one would be you scan the network, you didn't actually identify a breach, uh, or, a, or not necessarily a breach, but a, uh, a, a application or a device that could be at risk, and then a breach occurs. I think there's a question there as to, you know, what is eGestalt's stance on that? Who's responsible for that? Yeah, so the responsibility is at the end of the uh, at the end of the day is with the user. Depending, so you provide tool and solutions to um, to help you um, detect, uh, mitigate, and uh, monitor your risk levels. Uh, how you use the tool, how frequently you use it or not, is really uh, a, a usage model dependent uh, scenario. So, for example, you know, uh, you know, Cisco, for example, will sell you a firewall router, but they cannot guarantee that nobody can break in. It's a similar concept here that we provide the tool and give you all the all the tools needed to to really proactively go after these attackers. So the responsibility is um, is is really left to the user of the tool or the business that's deploying the tool and how how completely are they using the tool in its full glory or not. Got it, and that makes sense. We deal with our vendors to provide exactly what you said, our firewalls and things like that, and. That's the message that they've always given out. It's a tool. It has to be configured properly. You know, um, people have to be trained on how to use the tool. Um, right. But at the end of the day, it ends up being the, the client site uh, that the HIPAA auditors would find the responsibility and the fault with. A um, couple other ones. The slides are going to be available via the eGestalt website, um, so eGestalt.com. Uh, it's a recorded webinar, so you guys could download it. Um, the, we had a question as to where is the eGestalt. Uh, or the GFI solution kind of hosted? Well, it's a SaaS product. Um, it's hosted on Amazon Web Services. Um, if you guys have more questions on that in terms of the specific, I definitely recommend you guys uh, emailing uh, on a Palmer, the sales team, and they could go into it. Um, you know, and it is offered through other vendors uh, who could be, you know, your support team. So not necessarily Egestalt, but other vendors. And again, I'm sure the sales team at Egestalt would be able to help answer who those vendors are, um, would be able to have boots on the ground, as it were, to go out there and support your teams and not only implementing, but but ensuring that the product is being used to its fullest capacity. Um, and upon, uh, any any closing thoughts? No, I think uh, the other question about whether there are vendors that use this platform to deliver security as a service, yes, um, yes, um, there are a number of partners. And um, feel free to drop me a note if you if you need any further information. My contact information is here. Oops, <clears throat> it was there. So in terms of closing thoughts, what I would say is that this is a very complicated topic, and and what um, what we've tried to do here is to break it down into simple actionable items. And um, I, I've added a, a reference section here that uh, I encourage you to. Uh, to look at as well, which allows you to get more information, and um, and we will continue to evolve this. This is a very sophisticated um, um, attack patterns are changing by the day, 
and cyber attackers are getting more and more organized and, and sophisticated. So it's a constant battle. We as security uh, providers, we as security tool providers or security service providers have to continuously keep up and, and, and be uh, of, um, ahead of the attackers to ensure that um, we can detect these um, uh, cyber breaches and, and uh, prevent it and, um, and hopefully avoid getting the data being stolen. That's, that's, that is the goal. Well, thank you uh, for speaking today on this. Again, always a timely topic, especially, you know, given the recent news. I unfortunately expect we're going to be seeing a lot more of those breaches occurring um, through either gross negligence or through no, you know, fault of the company. It's just that the hackers have very sophisticated tools. Um, but it, as they say, it always gets worse before it seems to get better. Um, so thank you again, Anupam. Thank you, Gestalt. Uh, again, if people have questions about Wide River, we encourage you to go out to wideriver.com um, and stay tuned because this is a topic that we're going to be doing lots and lots of webinars on. So thank you again. Thank you all for coming and thank you. Have a great day.